The third president of our country was Thomas Jefferson from 1801 to 1809. Jefferson was a Virginian. He was born in Virginia. He was a planter, meaning that he owned a plantation or a very large farm. And uh, he was born in on April 13th, 1743. He became a lawyer and he again owned his plantation. And he married Martha Skelton in 1772. Uh, Jefferson was one of our great founding fathers. He served in our first Continental Congress, and he was involved in the second Continental Congress with writing the Declaration of Independence. We call him the father of the Declaration. Uh, he served as an ambassador to France during and after the Revolution, so he was vital and along with, uh, with Ben Franklin in getting the French to support the Americans during the American Revolution. He was the governor of Virginia uh, uh, many different times, and he served as the Secretary of State under George Washington. So he went back and forth to Europe and uh, all over the world, securing America's place in the world. He served as the vice president to John Adams, and he then was eventually elected as the third president in 1800. His vice president was Aaron Burr, and he died in 1826 on the same day as John Adams, 4th of July, 1826. Now, during Jefferson's presidency, there were all kinds of different problems, uh, but there were a lot of successes as well. He wanted to build a small but very strong government. That's part of his Democratic-Republican leanings. He wants the government to be small, not overreaching. He wanted a country of smart, well-educated farmers versus businessmen that were only caring about money. So Jefferson, he wanted to limit the power and the size of the federal government. At the same time, he wanted to keep our nation strong. So he uh, wanted to limit the power and cut spending, so he repealed the whiskey tax. He got rid of a lot of different positions in the federal government, and he cut the military. And uh, those are, that's a major source of um, spending, is always, always has been and always will be the military. Uh, Jefferson, though, even though he cut the Navy and the Army, he took a really tough stand on piracy. For years, Barbary pirates in the Mediterranean had been attacking and taking over American ships. And uh, so the U.S. had been kind of bribing those pirates, giving them money so that they leave us alone. And But eventually, we got sick of it. In 1801, the ruler of Tripoli, he wanted more money. So the U.S. said, yeah, we'll give you money in the form of cannons and uh, ships that are going to destroy you. So in 1805... Uh, well, between 1801 and 1805, uh, different ships went over there to Tripoli, and they bombarded the city. They sank all these pirate ships, and they took back and strengthened the seas for U.S. shipping. In 1805, the rulers in Tripoli signed treaties with the U.S. saying that they would not allow piracy anymore. So that was a great win for Jefferson. Um he also strengthened the judicial branch. The judicial branch interprets laws, and they have the power of judicial review, meaning that they can look at a law and declare it to be unconstitutional. So during his presidency, there was this issue called Marbury versus Madison. William Marbury was appointed by President John Adams as a federal judge. Adams made the appointment in the last hours of his presidency. So to be approved, he would have to be, um, or Congress would have to approve his appointment. Congress didn't have time to approve the appointment before Adams went away, you know, went and retired. When Jefferson became president, he wanted to prevent the appointment from becoming official. So he told James Madison, his secre secretary of state, not to deliver the appointment to Congress. And so for people that supported Marbury and Adams, all those Federalists, they got really mad about that. They said, James Madison, you have to do your job. Your job is to deliver the appointment to Congress so we can vote on it. Instead, though, Madison said, yeah, right, I'm not doing it. My boss, Jefferson, said don't deliver it. So this issue arose. Do government officials do their jobs or not? Can they have the choice of whether to deliver these, the appointment, for instance, or not? 
And so Marbury asked the Supreme Court to force Madison to deliver the papers. And now remember, Marbury is going to be a, he's going to be a federal judge. He'll be a member of the, the judicial branch. The legislative branch is waiting on this appointment so that they can uh, appoint this guy or approve his appointment. And the executive branch is the one that's holding all this up. So we have a lot of different issues here, checks and balances, separation of powers. And so finally, well, Congress had this law called writs of mandamus. Under this law, the courts could order a government worker to carry out their duties, any government worker. But the Supreme Court, they reviewed writs of mandamus, and they said this law is unconstitutional. The courts cannot order government workers to do their jobs. And so um, they struck down that law. And that was the first time that the courts used their power of judicial review. And that's very important to remember. We're going to ask this on a test. <clears throat> and we're going to ask it on your final. You're going to see it all through your career. Uh, Marbury versus Madison. And the issue is writs of mandamus. Can the federal courts tell government workers to do their job? And using the power of judicial review, the Supreme Court said, no, they cannot. They struck down that law. They got rid of it. They said the law is unconstitutional. All right. Uh, under Jefferson, our country expanded a lot. Jefferson purchased uh, the w Western Territory, the Louisiana Territory, and it's called the Louisiana Purchase. Even before the American Revolution, Americans had been moving west beyond the Appalachian Mountains. And uh, so Vermont, well, that's an eastern state, but that was a new state added in 1791. Kentucky became a new state in 1791. Tennessee became a new state in 1793, 96. And then uh, settlers kept moving west, west, west into Mississippi Territory and the Northwest Territory. So um, in 1803, a couple different incidences came together. Napoleon Bonaparte in France, he wanted money. He knew that there was really no hope for settling, settling French territories over here in North America. So he sold the Louisiana territory to the U.S. for $15 million, which was a serious bargain. Um, it doubled the size of the, of the United States. And then in 1804 to 1806, Jefferson sent a group of explorers named Lewis and Clark, and they mapped the new territory. That was their goal, to map the territory, to set up some relations with the tribes out west, and to basically make sure that, uh, or to see how the new country could use this new territory. And shortly after, Americans started moving into this area because of rich land, beautiful rich forest, thick forest rather, fresh water, and lots of different animal life. Here's a map. This shows the original uh, 13 states on the East Coast, then the new states between 1791 and uh, 1803, and then the Louisiana Territory. Look at that. It's a huge chunk of land that encompasses much of the Great Plains uh, and into the Rocky Mountains. Between 1804 and 1806, the uh, Louisiana Purchase was explored by Lewis and Clark, mainly this northern part up the Missouri River all the way to the west coast in uh, Oregon and Washington. In this area still today, you can, you can take the Missouri River and explore and see some of the greatest sites of our country all through Yellowstone Park, the Rocky Mountains, Idaho, Washington. It's really awesome up here. And um, the reports of Lewis and Clark led many, many, many thousands of people to travel west into this new land and claim their own land. Now, um, again, our country began arguing with Britain. During the early 1800s, the U.S. tried to remain neutral between France and Britain as they fought during the another, well, Napoleon taking over Europe. Uh, but both uh, both countries continued to take Brit or shoot my kids are so loud here quiet all right both England and France began continued to take American ships and impress American soldiers impress them 
doesn't mean they would do a song and dance and the Americans would say, wow, you guys are awesome. Impress means they would take American uh, sailors and put them into work, put them to work for the French Navy or the British Navy. So uh, to respond to this, Jefferson passed the Embargo Act. Jefferson and Congress, rather, passed the Embargo Act of 1807. Under this law, American merchants could not trade with any foreign nation. And because of that, American merchants lost a ton of money, and this really weakened Jefferson. It was just silly for the Congress and Jefferson to think that we could survive as a nation and not trade with foreign nations. Um, so we kind of changed it around a little bit. Jefferson and Congress changed it, and in 1809, they passed the Non-Intercourse Act, which under this law, American merchants could not trade only with Britain or France. And that was to try to punish these two nations for impressing our sailors. And instead, they impressed more sailors. And they said, well, this will show you, America. Um, and also, there, were con there continued to be Native American troubles. So because the British still stayed out west, still stayed in forts, still supported Native American tribes, those tribes still attacked, North, or attacked Americans, attacked settlers, attacked our army, our military. In 1811, there was the Battle of Tippecanoe, and uh, the American army under command of William Henry Harrison defeated a North American alliance of Native Americans. A uh, Native American alliance. Um, and again, many Americans saw that the British were to blame. So we have, going into our next president, three big problems. The British are seizing American merchant ships at sea. They are impressing American sailors. Again, not with a little jig, but with with work, with slavery, basically. They were enslaving our, our sailors. And finally, uh, they were giving Native Americans weapons to fight us. And they were telling them to attack our frontier settlers. So lots of problems between America and Great Britain leading into the presidency of James Madison. All right, the next president that we're going to look at is James Madison. He was president from 1809 to 1817. He served two terms, and then he went on with his life afterwards. Um, he was born in Virginia on March 16th, 1751. He became a lawyer, and he was married to Dorothy or Dolly Todd in 1794. Um, yeah, Dolly Madison is one of the one of the more famous women in our nation's history, and we'll see why in just a little while. His pr political career was also quite um, was quite impressive. He served in the Constitutional Convention, and he's known as the father of the Constitution because he wrote most of it, a great majority of it. He wrote many of the Federalist essays, and under Jefferson, he served as Secretary of State, and he died in 1836. During Madison's presidency, the United States uh, became entangled in a war with Great Britain known as the War of 1812. Um, and it started because many members of Congress wanted to, they just wanted to go to war with Britain. There were enough problems that had been boiling for years, and they decided it's time to just fight England again. We beat them before, and we will beat them again. These men were known as the War Hawks. And so Congress declared war on Britain in 1812. And even though they declared war, they really were not ready for war. There were less than 7,000 soldiers in the army. They had a very small navy. Uh, they had very little combat experience. And people were not in, not all people were in support of the war. So immediately the British blockaded the American coast, and that prevented the Americans from selling goods uh, or buying goods from outside. The British Army invaded the uh, United States. They got so far as to burn Washington, D.C. Um, and, uh, you know, major points of the war, basically, the uh, British attack on Fort McHenry, the burning of Washington, D.C., the writing of the Star-Spangled Banner by Francis Scott Key, and um, then we like to talk about how the USS Constitution was this ship, a great American ship that defeated many British ships. Um, so 
basically the War of 1812 has been nicknamed the Second American Revolution because by the end of the war, 1814, after the war became a standoff, um, the British gave up, they gave up this long distance war and agreed to remove American fort or remove British forts from America and also to uh, basically leave Will leave Americans alone. Who still have not come down. The auditorium, please come down. As well as sixth graders who need to pick up their cookie dough and spring items. Please report to the auditorium. Sixth and seventh graders, thanks. Okay, um, so results of the War of 1812. When the war ended in 1815, Europeans saw that, whoa, the United States is a force to be reckoned with. It was stronger than ever. It was stronger than the uh, Europeans thought it was. So the war created a greater sense of nationalism in the United States. Nationalism is the love for one's country. And uh, because we start, the Americans were winning wars and fighting these great powers, people started to be proud of their country. Also, the U.S. economy grew and expanded. Americans were more prosperous. Manufacturing increased. Trade increased. The seas were safer. It was just safer to do business, and people made a lot more money than they were in the past. And then the, also the Republican Party increased its power in the government. And by this point, the feder the Federalists were kind of just falling apart. They were wasting away and becoming a party that really didn't matter much anymore. Our fifth president was James Monroe. He served from 1817 to 1825. He was born in Virginia on, 18, on April 28, 1758, and he married Elizabeth Courtright in 1786. He was a U.S. Senator from Virginia, and he was a governor of Virginia. He served as the ambassador to Great Britain. He was the Secretary of State and Secretary of War, so he was quite experienced in political matters, and he died in 1831. Now, uh, we're getting to, the group, to a group of men who really weren't that involved with the revolution, the American Revolution, so we're getting away from the founding fathers as our presidents, um, and that's going to start to make a, quite a change in our country. Uh, so, James Monroe, when he came to be the president, the nation was very peaceful. It was peaceful and profitable. Wars with England and France had died down, and there was only one political party that ran the government. That party was the, is the Republicans. So Americans, they were basically happy with the government because they were successful, and the economy was growing. Americans were prosperous. And all of this period of time during Monroe's presidency is called the era of good feelings. Mm, people were happy. And uh, there just weren't a lot of big problems in the country. <clears throat> now, Congress was led by three, mainly by three outspoken men. And then all of their followers would vote along their lines. So John Calhoun, he was from South Carolina, and he supported policies that favored the South. Daniel Webster was from Massachusetts. He favored policies that supported the Northeast. And Henry Clay from Kentucky supported policies that favored the West. All three of these um, men and their groups were uh, loyal to their section of the country that they came from because the sections had different interests. And this idea is called sectionalism. Sectionalism is loyalty to your local interests. And sectionalism will, it, it began to, uh, it's always been a part of our country, um, but in this period of time, it was extremely important because it's the, it's kind of the kickoff to the Civil War, where as parts of the country started to get out of touch with other parts of the country. The North uh, Northeast doesn't understand the requirements, the needs of the South, and the West is kind of left out to dry. So sectionalism, that loyalty to local interests, it causes stress and problems. Um, during this time, Henry Clay, though, he proposed what is called the American System. It's a program designed to make the United States self-sufficient and independent of the world. Uh, we saw being entangled in other, in other countries' business, it 
caused problems, just like Washington had warned. So um, we tried to make our country more self-sufficient. We did this by putting tariffs or taxes on imported goods to help American businesses. So um, international goods would cost more than American goods, so people would want to buy American goods because they're cheaper. Uh, new roads and canals, canals were built to improve transportation, and the government created a new national bank, all to allow people to have access to more money, to um, give people the feeling that our country is strong and growing. Between 1812 and 1821, five new states we entered the United States. Or any students who have not come down to pick up their fundraiser order, especially a lot of sixth graders have not come down, please report to the auditorium now. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, five new states, Louisiana, Indiana, Mississippi, Illinois, and Alabama, all entered. And notice what I have there for designations, free state and slave state. By this time, people were already arguing over whether or not to allow slavery. And the uh, slave issue would carry these people into Congress, and these states into Congress. So the Senate was split 50-50. Half supported slavery, half did not support slavery. And with that threat of allowing or not allowing slavery was always the threat of secession or seceding, which means um, disjoining the union, leaving the union. Um, let's see. In 1820, Maine entered as a free state, and that was going to upset the, the balance in this country. Uh, the balance of slave states and free states. So the Missouri Compromise was proposed and followed. The Missouri Territory in 1819 applied for statehood. They wanted to enter as a slave state, and so that meant that slavery was legal in the state. Now, the northern states objected because there'd be one more slave state, and the free states would lose power in Congress. And the southern states, they wanted this because then they could expand slavery into new territory. And by this time, many, many states, many people in you know, much of the northern part of the country, they wanted to prevent slavery from spreading anywhere into the new territory. So the Missouri Compromise said this right here. Under the Compromise, Maine enters as a free state and Missouri entered as a slave state. So the slave and free states were balanced. But slavery was allowed south of the 3630 north latitude line, but not allowed north. So there's a line drawn that you can see here, right here, that no slavery is allowed above it, but slavery is allowed below it. So that for a while kept um, the balance between slave and free states as it was balanced. And hopefully people hoped that it prevented the spread of slavery. Uh, between 1810 and 1824, Spain lost control of its colonies in, America, in the Americas. So the United States benefited from this because they took over much of the uh, Spanish territory in Florida. Uh, President Monroe began a policy designed to end European influence and involvement in American affairs. And um, in 1819, the U.S. paid $5 million for Spain, or to Spain for Florida and acquired it in the adams onus Treaty. Now, the next huge uh, piece of information that you have to know for President Monroe is called the Monroe Doctrine. It was passed in 1823, and it really defined our foreign policy, the United States foreign policy, for the next 150 years. Uh, so President Monroe announced a new policy that the U.S. government would follow. The policy is known as the Monroe Doctrine, and it says that the U.S. would stay out of European affairs. We wouldn't get involved, just like we had been saying we wouldn't be involved for years. It also said that Europe was to stay out of the Western Hemisphere, or out of North and South America. And it said that the U.S. would oppose any European attempt to colonize the Americas. So it was kind of like a warning shot over Europe. It said, stay out. And Europe, well, it was up to them. They could either push it, they could try to get, uh, to try to take colonies and fight the America, Americans, or they could follow um, the warning and stay out. 
So for the next, like I said, 150 years or so, um, the Monroe Doctrine really did keep the the European powers away from North and South America. They were afraid to fight another war, afraid to fight this powerful country, America.